Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Gaiman. And I'm Kirby Gaiman. And we're here from MASH, the Manitoba Association for Schooling at Home. And today we're going to answer some of your homeschooling questions. So I hear everyone in the uh, Facebook group and, and uh, online and they're all talking about all the different styles of homeschooling that you have to, you have to find and choose a style. What do they mean by different styles of homeschooling? So because there are so many people at this time who are coming home to homeschool and they're anticipating that their children will go back into the schools as soon as possible, they're really wanting to do at home what is happening at school. And so mm -hmm. in the homeschool community, we would call that schooling at home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty simple. But I would guess that while there are some homeschoolers who do school at home, mostly for that reason, because mm -hmm. they anticipate that their children will be moving back into the system and they want to ease some of that uh, transition. Most homeschoolers actually choose to school at home or if they don't in the beginning, they end up realizing that a homeschooling education can be much different from what it looks like in the classroom. And I actually think that that's one of the primary bonuses of homeschooling. So once you realize that you're not doing school at home, then it kind of opens up mm -hmm. the world. And so if you're doing school at home is one end of the spectrum, then I would say at the other end of the spectrum is something called unschooling. And it was created after some books by John Holt, who was a award-winning educational teacher in New York, I think, in the 70s or 80s. And he discovered that children actually had this innate desire to learn, this natural curiosity that drove them to seek out information and to learn skills. But he felt that the actual school system in many ways was damaging that natural Ooh. curiosity. And so he... Some of us have felt that. And so he, he wrote a book about unschooling, about trying to take out the damaging parts of what the public system sometimes does for children and their natural curiosity. And homeschoolers, um, that really resonated with homeschoolers mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s. And so this, this new approach to homeschooling or what we're gonna call a style here was called unschooling. And even within the unschooling community now, there's a lot of variation and there's radical unschoolers and there's more laid back unschoolers. So basically unschooling is about child-led education so that children have these natural interests, they have this natural curiosity and a parent's job, an educator's job is to merely provide the child with all the resources they need in order to satisfy that curiosity. So uh, no scheduled lessons? Like when you say give them the resources, does that mean the textbooks? No, it would, it would all be generally, well, see, okay, so this is where you get styles within styles because a radical unschooler wouldn't even, there would be no textbooks. Radical unschooler would just let a child go. And if a child woke up one day and said, I want to learn to make lasagna, then it would be a parent's job to help the child do that. And it might be up to the child to find a recipe and then to okay. make the grocery list. And, you know, if your child's old enough, you would take your child to the store, but they would purchase it. And so that would probably be on the one end. Whereas I tend to, I tend to unschooling tendencies. I'm very child led in a lot of ways in my education um, approach, but I also, I like to choose the books. I like to put mm, in front okay. of my children. So I, I decide that we're going to learn history this year, but then I might let my children as a group decide what, um, what era of history they want to choose from. Or, or if I say, oh, we're doing medieval, then I might let my children choose to choose what part. So if I have one who really wants to study knights, but I have one that really wants to study medieval cooking techniques, mm -hmm. then I would let them. So, so there's this whole range. And in between schooling at home yeah, so and unschooling is all these, like as many styles as there are homeschoolers. So in between those two extremes, then school at home, mm -hmm. unschooling, what does can you, can you put a few dots in the middle just so that okay, we've got some so, names to hang things on? Some names. So there's uh, Montessori and Waldorf, who were both educators in the early 1920s, I think. And their approach was that uh, a child was holistic. And so education should be 
should be whole, especially for young children, that they felt that it should be hands-on, it should be, there's a Reggio, which is very similar to it, which is project-based, that our children should, our children learn by the completion of something, a goal, and working towards it, and then completing this project. You'll get classical homeschooling, which is based on the Greek and Roman approach to education, which okay. says that there's three levels of learning. So children um, start off in the grammar age, which is the acquisition of knowledge. And then they move into the logic stage, which is where they learn to think about ideas. And then they can move into the rhetoric stage, which is where you learn to argue, support, and defend your, your own personal ideas and beliefs. So that would be like an entire schooling system designed around those three yeah, phases. So yeah, so that would be the approach you would teach in that way. And then there's all sorts of materials. Uh, the most popular homeschooler to forward this approach is uh, Susan Wise Bauer, who wrote The Well-Trained Mind. That's actually available in, well, I think it was available in both editions at our public library. And it's just, it's a big, thick book. But if you want to know how to homeschool in the classical way, you read that book, you will be good to go. It was actually quite foundational for me. I don't follow it, but it was foundational for me in my early years when I read it. So what else might there be? Classical? Uh, unit studies. Units. So unit studies, actually unit studies are done quite extensively in the public school system. Lots of elementary teachers will use them. This is where you pick a theme and then you try to draw um, in all your subject areas under that theme. So if we were studying ants, we would do maybe the history of ants. I don't know if there's a history of ants. <laughs> a history of ant farming. Yeah. Um, but you would study all the science around ants and you would, um, instead of doing your language arts separately, you would write about ants. You would, you would, you would draw ants. So that would be part of, you might sing ants. You your know. math examples would involve ants. Ants, right. Yeah. yeah. So, and that, and that could be for older years, you might do a historical study or you might, so you might do, you're going to study uh, let's say you're going to study World War One. So you're going to do the history of World War One, and you're going to look at this, the technological advances that happened uh, for science in World War One. You might do um, the psychology. You might do the psychology of what happened. That's the first time that post-traumatic stress disorder was. Mm -hmm. So, the, so there are all these. So it's a multidisciplinary approach. Literature that was written in World War One. Yes, literature that was written in World War One. Literature that's about World War One. Cool. Films, movies, docs, kind of this whole thing. So it's a multidisciplinary approach using a, a, a theme to pull everything together. So that's unit studies. Unit studies. Unit studies. Um, so then there's like Charlotte Mason. She was a, a developmental educator, which means that she believes that children develop naturally when given the right materials. And so part of her right materials was something she called living books. And so this is a literary approach to education where children merely they read books and they interact with those books and those books have to, we're not talking about textbooks. Um, in, in Charlotte's case, a uh, living book was a book that was written by one individual who was passionate and learned in their subject area. And children would read those books on their own. It's not meant for an educator to, mm -hmm. to chew up the information and feed it out to them. It's meant for a child to interact directly with the material and to make their own uh, ideas and then to discuss their ideas and with help to put those ideas into some form that they then could put back out in the world. So that's a Charlotte Mason approach to education. I know I'm missing some because I don't know them all. But at least now we have some, let's say we have some dots on the line that people can say, oh, that might interest me and hopefully go right. out and search them. So that will hopefully be of great value to people. Yeah. And there's a, in the, in the Facebook group, and I guess we'll post it down below, there's a link to a quiz that someone did. And I think there's quite a few questions mm -hmm. there. That's quite long. And you can answer those questions and it might give you an idea of what you value. You can also think about, you and, know. And from that, what you value, it, it suggests some, some uh, homeschooling styles. Exactly. And approaches yeah. that you might take a look at. Yeah. And it might be a time for you to think back, like, what was your educational experience like? What did you wish you had more of? What did you wish you, you know, you know if you're really hands-on learner and you would like for your kids to get in and dirty, you might want to look at a project-based approach. 
um, if you're, if you really like themes, if you like mm -hmm. having, you know, if you're someone who I think to someone, if you, you know, if you go crazy over Christmas, because Christmas is a huge theme for you, yeah. then you can spend the entire December just doing Christmas themes and have, you can do science, you can do cooking, you could do, you know, so it's about, partly it's about looking about what you want and how you want it to be. And then it's kind of maybe looking at what you want for your kids and how your kids want it to be. And the younger children are, the more hands-on or play oriented it needs to be. Even like, even the, I was just on the Ontario website and they have a beautiful paper about how early years education needs to be attachment oriented and play-based. And that's very much true. And so, uh, and I mean, that's the way I, I educate all the way through high school that way. But so when you're, especially when you're dealing with younger years, that would, you'd want to choose a style that has lots of hands-on activity, mm -hmm. lots of play. And that's the real balance that you have to strike is I, as a parent, like this style or want this style or think this style would be best. And you have to balance that with not only how old are my children and what would be best for them, but also what they want. Yes. And uh, yeah, there's a, cause there's a push pull. There's a balance yeah. that has to be struck between what you as a parent want, what you as a parent feel will be best for your children and what your children want. There's kind of a well, three way not, battle. Right? And not always even not what battle, your children three way want. discussion. And not even always what your children want, but what your children might be capable yeah, of. That's true. Because your children, you know, you may want for your children to have an online education and to be able to sit down and just fill out, you know, boom, 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 yeah. and we're done for the day. But small children might not be able to do that. Or children who suffer from anxiety or mm -hmm. attention deficit disorder, they may struggle more with that. They may need to have more hands-on learning. They may have more learning that's visual or auditory. And so, mm -hmm. so. And there's, there's other practical bits to it too your child might want to do unit studies about dinosaurs and all that thing, but unit studies can be very uh, time intensive. They can be, In yes. planning and executing. So, and maybe you, you simply, you have other children, you, whatever, you, you, you don't have the time to do that. There's all sorts of factors that can go into choosing this. Yeah. And one of the other things that we have the luxury at, at homeschool is to combine so that if you're doing a unit study for dinosaurs, you can include, you can include a high schooler, you can include a middle years, you can mm. include a elementary student and do this huge you know, obviously what your high schooler is going to discover <laughs> about dinosaurs will be very different, but, but you could do the, you can do the history of the dinosaur discovery, right. And mm -hmm. include it in with actual paleontology with, um, the biochemistry, you know, dating of mm -hmm. bones. And so, yeah. And so you can combine children in all sorts of styles as well. They can learn, or you can just do bits and pieces. So you can do a unit study that's just on dinosaur. That's just for science. It doesn't have to and be. And then use a textbook and do school at home for math. Yes. And then do a literature study for English. Yes. And unschool for arts. Just give pe give your kids access and let them go yes. for arts and music and that sort of thing. Yeah. So you can you can mix and match. You don't have to choose Absolutely. just one. Absolutely. And we call that, and this is the this is what I call myself, we call that eclectic. So any homeschooler that just picks and chooses across styles and resources, um, yeah, we call them eclectic. And I, I would suspect that most of us who've been doing this for, you know, more than a handful of years end up being eclectic because honestly, that's what works. You just, you change, your kids change, you have different seasons, you have seasons where you're busier, seasons where you're not. Oh, that's important. So you don't have to just pick one style and stick to it. No. Children do thrive on routine and it does take I always tell new parents when they come, because I have my own curriculum that I've written, I always tell parents to stick with it for, try to stick with it for three months before you give up on it. Mm -hmm. Because it can be like, sometimes it's just change and it takes us a while to get into change. Changing too fast can, yeah. giving up too fast can be stressful? It can be for everybody. Okay. So, and then sometimes it's getting into the routine that will make it easier. And, and I guess the important thing is once you kind of figure out a style or have it in your mind, what, um, approach you want to use, that makes it easier to find your resources. If you just go out looking for yeah. resources, you're going to be inundated with thousands of choices. Anything we can do to limit that is a good thing. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you found this video interesting or helpful, please like and subscribe. You'll find more videos answering more questions on our channel. 
You can also check out our webpage at manitobahomeschool.com. Or look us up on Facebook under Manitoba Association for Schooling at Home. Take care.